welcome um, to a talk about strategies for reducing bird collisions. Um, I've taken that title relatively broadly, you will see. Oh, you will see if I can actually get the slides to advance. So one of the most important things that anybody can do um, if you're interested in collisions is to try to educate anybody that you can um, about the problem of collisions um, and also the fact that there are solutions. Um, there's a, a lot of mythology out there um, and depending on whether you're an individual or you're an organization, um, you can use any of these strategies and others in fact um, to try to get uh, people interested in doing this. And when I do this at ABC, um, there's a fair amount of information that I try to get across, although it's hard to do it in a single sound bite. Um, most of you obviously are aware of the value of birds. Many, many people have absolutely no idea um, that it's in their self-interest to try um, to protect birds from being hit by buildings or anything else. Um, so this is this is useful. People sort of think of birds as something that's lit in the trees and <clears throat> really isn't relevant to everyday life, and that um, is definitely not the case. I assume all of you actually are pretty well versed on that. Um, the extent of mortality is something people have a hard time believing. Um, the numbers that were created by the Smithsonian after their meta-analysis published in 2014, uh, 300 million to a billion, we think is probably closer to a billion. A lot of glass has gone into the world since 2014. All the data was taken before 2014. And since 2014, we've learned that um, many monitors uh, miss more birds than had been assumed. Um, so there are a number of reasons to, to think that the number is on the high side. The only thing um, that's really worse is cats. Um, please keep your cats indoors. Um, it's important for their well-being, for wildlife, um, and also for you. Most mortality takes place on homes and low-rise buildings, or a better way to think about this is most mortality takes place up to about the 11th floor. Um, so. We don't have super good data on very tall towers, but they, certainly there is some mortality above um, 75 feet or 11 floors, whatever that trans translates into. But the majority of mortality is lower down. And this is the same thing as um, most car crashes happen within 20 miles of home. That's where you do all your driving. Birds are largely active um, during the day, flitting around. Um, in the area that's vegetated up to the top of the trees and sometimes above if they're trying to um, <clears throat> locate a new place to fly to. Um, so it makes it a little more difficult because really every building um, can be a problem and often is. A lot of people think collisions are unusual. They, they truly don't understand the numbers. Everybody has heard or seen a bird hit a window but they don't put together how many collisions have to happen for everybody to have had that experience. Um, again, it's uh, up to a billion. Because the peaks of mortality um, tend to be with migrating songbirds in the spring and fall, and because these birds largely migrate at night, um, there's, there's been a, a misconception um, that birds are actually running into tall buildings while they're migrating. And this is not what's happening. Um, birds, while they're migrating, um, are high enough to go over any building that we might build. Uh, but as they come down or as they're forced down by weather, um, they come into the range um, of the built environment um, and lighting of the built environment is an added attraction for them. So, it used to be a long time ago, and we're talking 100 years ago and so forth, um, that 
big collision events were a lot more frequent than they are now. Um, okay, sorry, the audio was supposed to be turned off. Um, but if you think about it, you know, if you go back to the 1890s or to 1920, lots of cities had one tall structure, whether it was the Empire State Building or the Fauche Tower in Minneapolis, um, the Washington Monument. Um, now, um, buildings well, all over the place are lit. The, the built environment is enormous. You can see here, Metropolitan Houston is bigger than the state of New Jersey, all lit up at night. So where you used to get a situation where there was a bright light surrounded by darkness, that is not the case most of the time. Um, but it's what caused people to associate collisions with tall structures. Now, um, we see collisions throughout urban areas like this. Um, and a conventional lights out program is not gonna have much luck um, having an impact on, on this. I mean, what we need to do is work on trying to get citywide ordinances to, to turn out lights, especially um, towards the time when birds are coming down. So you probably could get away with 2 a.m. at least. Um, as far as I know, there have been no reports of birds being discombobulated when they're taking off. So what's happening seems to be happening when they're coming down. It helps to know a bit about how birds see the world because it's very very different from the way we do um, and it's hard for us to actually believe that but primates um, humans and, and others have eyes that are close together their faces are flat they don't have much of anything sticking out between their eyes we have very good depth perception 3d vision and we tend to see the world as something in front of us something that we're going into now, birds on the other hand um, may see totally different things with each eye, um, which is really hard to wrap your head around. They don't have a lot of three-dimensional vision depth perception, and they use totally different mechanisms to figure out how fast they're flying and where they're going. Um, so they presumably experience the world as something they're immersed in, and what is in front of them is not necessarily uh, more important or even as important as what's out to the side or behind them. Um, so my model of a bird flying through what it believes to be an uncluttered environment is actually a kid texting on a skateboard, but this guy texting on a hoverboard is the closest I've been able to get. Um, so his attention is definitely not focused where he's going, but he's moving in that direction. Um, and when we're trying to stop bird collisions, what we have to do is call the bird's attention to the fact that there's something in front of them that they're not expecting to be there. A lot of people believe they can see glass um, and I don't know, I've certainly slammed into a couple of doors myself and, and walls. It happens all the time. People learn about a concept of glass when they're very young, probably by bumping into things relatively gently. <clears throat> Birds, on the other hand, really can't understand that. They can understand individual pieces of glass in some cases, but they never understand the concept of glass as either a transparent barrier or glass as something that's reflecting um, a realistic view of habitat. If I take away the cues that you use to do this, you can't tell me if that's a picture of a tree or a tree seen through a clear glass window or if it's a tree reflected in glass. There's just no way for you to know that. When I give you a few more cues, you know that right angles aren't natural, you can see a crack in the glass, you understand those are mullions. <clears throat> you realize that this has to be glass of some form or other. It's only when I show you this that you understand that that's a reflection. Birds don't understand any of those cues. They do not understand glass as a concept. They see the world as something literal. Um, when we want to signal them that we want them to change direction, to stop flying straight forward, um, I mean, you can sort of think of it as you want to like stick a tree up there um, so that the birds realize they have to fly around it. <clears throat> That's obviously a massive oversimplification. Um, but we can stop birds by two-dimensional and three-dimensional, I call everything patterns. Um, but a 3D pattern is something like louvers or a window screen, something like that's installed in front of glass. 
um, 2D patterns um, can be integral to glass or you can uh, stick something up on it. But it turns out that birds have a very good understanding of their body size. Um, and this is what explains the sort of two by four rule that people have been talking about for quite a long time or the handprint rule or a child's handprint rule. Um, and you can see that there would be an asymmetry um, in spacing. Um, it's easier for birds to, to fly through a narrow gap like this than it is if they're just flapping. Um, these days, are, the general recommendation is really two inches for vertical as well as for horizontal because this does not work for hummingbirds and probably for the smallest warblers either. So the guideline really is two by two at this point. Um, and it doesn't have to be lines. It doesn't have to be dots. The spacing is critical. Um, but it's also very important that birds are able to see uh, the things that are creating the spacing. Um, and that uh, is relevant to another difference between uh, bird vision and human vision. We can actually discriminate um, two objects at a distance better than birds can. Um, it makes it very difficult for us to have things that people won't notice but that will deter birds. So in addition to sort of general education, um, I also do a lot of education of architects. Um, one of the the best ways, if not the best way, um, to get bird-friendly building design out there um, is to train architects so that the discussion happens before the building is designed. Um, and all architects, as well as lots of other professionals, have to take continuing education classes. Um, and uh, the class I do uh, has been approved by the Green Building Council as well as the AIA. But if you're a landscape architect, you know you can take it and uh, you just submit a certificate. So there are ways for for different groups to take this for credit, even if um, there's no formal connection. I usually start when I talk to architects by showing them this. Um, there's a very strong myth out there that to be bird friendly, glass essentially has to be opaque. Um, and you know some of the original solutions that that we proposed um, did look like you've whitewashed your windows. But if you want to have a boring glass box and still have it be bird friendly, you can do that. Um, this is the Intuit headquarters. It's in Mountain View, California, a community that requires bird friendly design. Um, this is a pattern that covers somewhat less than seven percent of the glass surface. It's very easy to see out. Um, you don't notice it from much of a distance. Um, architects are always worried that uh, we're going to interfere with their creativity. Um, and that does not have to be that you ought to be able to do a bird friendly building that looks like almost anything you wanted to. Another thing that I always thought architects understood, but which it turns out they don't necessarily because they're not engineers, is that these giant curtain wall buildings are not actually sustainable. When I first started, there was a lot of talk about how ironic it was that sustainable design required all this glass. Well, it doesn't. Um, you can get plenty of light into a building for people um, at, with a lot less glass than this. And once you're above 20 to 40 percent glass on a facade, your heating and cooling costs go up, which means that you have to spend a lot more on equipment, um, on energy. Uh, you blow out more greenhouse gases. So bird-friendly design is actually very sustainable. Um, and it shouldn't be thought of as an add-on. That's the first thing that everybody sort of assumes, that it's, it's on top of. Whereas if you get people thinking about this before they design their building, if it's integral to the design, it should not have additional cost. Um, this is a bird-friendly building that was built by the federal government um, years ago before anybody was having a discussion about bird-friendly design. It's a little strange looking. Um, this is the FBI headquarters in Houston. Um, it's got a sunshade, uh, which also doubles as a security measure. Um, it's fun to point out examples like this, um, that these buildings were being built before 
there was a loud conversation um, about bird friendly design. Um, this is a building from Vancouver um, that has a bird friendly pattern on the glass. Um, you can see there's probably a, a very bright and light on the inside. If anybody's noticed the new Statue of Liberty Museum on L uh, that um, has a bird friendly glass, uh, which people aren't really able to notice um, unless they come right up close to it. Uh, Utah has no requirements anywhere for bird friendly design, and yet when they designed the SJ Quinney School of Law, they wanted to make 100% of the glass bird friendly. It just looks like a boring building. The Javits renovation in New York City is um, a really good case study. Uh, they basically more than doubled the size of the building. It was an all glass building. They expanded the amount of glass and it went from being at the top of the list um, identified by the New York City Audubon Monitoring Program you know, as bird killing buildings in New York City um, to basically not being on the list at all anymore, even though there's also a green roof on top here, um, which obviously is gonna attract birds. Um, but all of this glass has a pattern that birds can see and will avoid. Um, you have to have something on a glass building like this so that the people inside aren't going to fry. Um, and instead of having teeny weeny dots that uh, aren't visible and don't do anything, um, you make somewhat bigger dots, it becomes a bird friendly design for the same cost. So there was no incremental cost for turning this building from a bird killer into a non-bird killer. And last but not least, you can have shiny reflective glass if you want to in a bird friendly design. Um, so these are, these are things that I really try to get to architects right at the beginning um, so that by the time I'm done, you know, they're all sort of saying, oh, we could do that as opposed to sort of being um, hostile and, and worried, you know, that I'm going to propose that people just live in bunkers now. We're seeing more and more retrofit solutions also. This is just a quick summary slide, um, but, you know, retrofits can range from what is, you know, quite elegant window film that you really can't see, but that works very, very well, um, to using 79 cents worth of tempera paint to dab a pattern on the outside of your window. Um, this is feather friendly. It goes up like a window film, but you rip off the backing. Um, this is a view from the interior of an eco lodge. They've used uh, copian bird savers, cord that's strung every four inches. This is an example of something I hope that someday we'll see more of. This is a, actually one of the windows to a chiropractic office, and they have somebody who comes in and paints seasonal decorations. So this was an Easter decoration one year, but every season um, they make their windows bird friendly unintentionally by putting these decorations out there, which I think just makes the customers happy. As I mentioned earlier, um, it's difficult once a building has been designed to make it bird friendly. It's hard to do that. Um, when you see an announcement like this, this is a building that Google's planning to put up near the waterfront in Houston, it's all glass. Um, there may have been a competition. Uh, the architects have spent a lot of money on uh, doing the initial design. Um, Everybody is emotionally invested in the design. They may have already ordered the glass by the time um, you get to the point where it's published in the newspaper. So all the more reason to try to talk to people, although I know I did a class for at least one office of Pelly Clark Pelly, and they should be ashamed of themselves um, for building this thing. Um, but this is legal. I mean, that's the the real problem, and it's the the reason that legislation is a very important tool. Um, because unless there's a zoning code or other official reason that you can't build a glass bird killer on a site, you really you know you're stuck with appealing to the better nature of the developers, um, who are largely focused on the bottom line. So it's difficult. Um, to get them to modify their design, you're asking them really to do a retrofit. Um, so it's better to be preemptive. Um, you know, we work with groups across the country and 
we're seeing a huge increase um, in the municipalities, counties, other jurisdictions, states, um, and at the federal level um, in multiple countries, um, both, Toronto, both Toronto, right, both Canada and the U.S., um, have an increasing number of places that are requiring bird-friendly design at some level. Um, and this is something that ABC can help you with if you're interested in doing it um, in your state, in your city, you know, in your in your locale. Um, this is what is going to push back against that type of design. Now, if, if you, I don't know, not, not too many of you are probably as old as I am, but I remember when they first started to require that motorcyclists wear motorcycle helmets. Um, and there was incredible screaming and wailing and, and talk about civil right infringement and so forth. And now everybody does it and it's like a fashion statement. Um, and this is what we're starting to see happen here. Um, the, the more people understand about this, the more places we can get people to notice um, that this is happening and the more laws there are, um, the more everybody else will be encouraged to, to basically follow suit. We're at the point where we can say, look, San Francisco has been working on this since 2011. They haven't had to increase the size of their planning department. They haven't built a lot of ugly, dark buildings. Um, every time one of these projects starts, somebody uh, wants to propose legislation that will mandate bird-friendly design. People are worried that it's gonna cost more. They're worried that it's gonna be a huge burden for the planning department. They're worried that buildings will be ugly or not creative. This has not happened any of the places um, that have started to do this. And in fact, San Francisco has been followed by about a dozen different communities, um, both existing and pending, um, which is unlikely to have happened if they noticed that San Francisco was having a serious problem um, implementing this kind of law. So we're getting more and better arguments. Um, there are energy arguments. Um, the bird-friendly design materials often uh, double as ways to reduce uh, the cost of heating um, because they protect buildings from uh, too much light and, and too much heat. Um, so there, there are very strong arguments for bird-friendly design that doesn't have to make you sound like a little old lady in tennis shoes. Uh, now another thing that ABC does um, is we rate glass. Um, we have a, this contraption out um, at the Powderville Nature Reserve, uh, which is part of the Carnegie Museum. It's about an hour outside of Pittsburgh. Um, this thing rotates, um, and when it's running, uh, Powderville has a banding station, uh, so they ban birds year-round, but especially they get large numbers during the spring and fall migration, and birds that have been banded, most of them will come out to the tunnel um, and they're put into the tunnel through a sleeve that you can't see here, um, but it's dark and they see what appears to be two ways that they might be able to get out. Um, interestingly, if there's no glass there or if there are two pieces of clear glass, 50% of the birds will go to the left and 50% will go to the right. So birds are not handed um, in terms of flying out of a tunnel. There's a net um, that's at the end of the tunnel, um, the glass is suspended about 18 inches in front of the net, so birds are not injured. They make one flight um, down. The more birds fly to the control, um, which when we're testing something is next to a, a, a pattern. You can see that here. This is a patterned glass next to a transparent control. The more we think that the pattern is effective in encouraging birds um, to avoid it. Um, and that has allowed us, um, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go through a bunch of data, um, but when, when we first started trying to talk to architects, I mean, I just celebrated my 10th anniversary at ABC. Um, and back when I first started, we would give recommendations that sounded like increased visual noise um, or don't use large expanses of glass. And what you get back is what's visual noise? How do I know if I've, got enough of it, how big is large, how far is near. Um, architects are used to things that are quantified, and 
glass in particular is usually rated for insulation. It's rated for breaking strength. It's rated for transmission, reflection of light, and you know things like that. So what architects really wanted to be able to do bird-friendly design was a system of rating glass. And this is something that um, ABC has been trying to do. Um, and it was what enabled us to get a lead credit for reducing bird collisions in the lead building rating system. And there are interesting things in this data, but there's, uh, we, I'm happy to talk to anybody later if they are interested. Um, so resources. On ABC's website, um, there are quite a few resources. Um, we have this flyer, which uh, focuses on solutions for homeowners or uh, sort of small jobs. Um, Bird-friendly building design um, has a review of the literature as well as discussions of different types of solutions. We also have an annotated bibliography of the science um, behind why birds collide with glass and why some solutions work and, and some solutions don't. Um, this flyer's actually been translated into Spanish and Portuguese as well as English. Um, this has been translated into Korean um, and is about to also be available in Portuguese. Uh, there's a group in Brazil that's been tr translating it. Um, and we have other uh, documents on the ABC website. We also have our BirdSmart Glass page, um, which uh, lists the different materials um, that have scored well enough or that have been evaluated with a high enough uh, number for ABC to consider it bird friendly. Now we have a relatively low bar. Um, we consider something bird friendly if we're sure that it will reduce collisions by at least 50%. That is the end. 